Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's ISTVS Terra Mechanics Byte. I will be your host for today, Andres Bienza. I'm a PhD student at the University of Pretoria. And today's guest is Dr. Tinas Buerta, also a researcher at the University of Pretoria. He's a senior lecturer in the Mechanical and Aeronautical Engineering Department, and he will be discussing his work today on camera-based measurements in terra mechanics and off-road uh, vehicle dynamics. So um, please, Tinas Buta, if you can um, join me on, on screen. Uh, morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever everyone might find themselves. Uh, thanks, Andres, for the um, introduction. Uh, I'm not sure if you have any other things you want to discuss before I start my presentation. No, nothing specifically for me. So if you have any issues throughout the session, just um, call out and we'll help you. Okay. Well, thanks very much. So um, as Andres has mentioned, I'm a uh, researcher at the Vehicle Dynamics Group, uh, which is at the University of Victoria. And we generally focus a lot of re our research on vehicles, specifically off-road vehicles. So uh, this presentation is basically some of the work we've done on off-road vehicles, specifically focusing on using camera-based measurement techniques um, in order to get uh, interesting measurements or replace certain sensors or get uh, more information of a, a specific phenomenon that we might be interested in. So, um, so why digital image correlation? Well, digital image correlation is all about really using cameras, um, which then views a specific scene. This could be a single camera. Uh, it could be two or multiple cameras, depending on what you're interested in. And we'll allude to sort of uh, using both single and multiple camera views uh, in certain of these applications. Uh, but first and foremost, it's a non-contact measurement technique. You know, you just need to have a camera viewing the scene. So that's one thing you need to be able to physically view the uh, scene of interest that you that you want to measure uh, something of. Um, but you don't have to place another measurement on top of something. You know, you don't have to place a accelerometer or whatever on top of the system. You just have to have a camera viewing the system. So that makes it quite uh, beneficial to uh, measure certain uh, things with. Um, and you can perform this with low cost cameras. So, um, you know, we've used pretty low cost cameras uh, from a few hundred dollars to quite high, uh, more expensive cameras costing, you know, a few thousand dollars, depending on uh, the resolution, which quite often can increase accuracy or uh, resolution, um, as well as perhaps higher frame rates to be able to measure a higher phenomena that might be, you might have interest in. Um, now, what we basically then obtain is a sequence of images, either from one camera or multiple cameras, and we can then apply different algorithms to these images. If we record the images and do sort of post-processing, we can also do some of these measurements in real time. Um, but we can apply these algorithms to these images, and then we can sort of find measurements from them. And again, we'll allude to some of these measurements that we can uh, obtain from them. Um, and, you know, you could use the same set of images and apply one algorithm to determine something, another uh, algorithm to determine something else. Um, and, you know, that makes it very flexible that you can have uh, one data recording and apply different uh, algorithms, whatever, you know, you might be interested in. And you can change these algorithms as well if you're following the sort of post-processing uh, route, which, you know, from a research point of view is, is, is quite beneficial. What you also then have is an actual visual recording of the phenomenon that you're measuring, you know, um, instead of just having a single measurement, which you now, if you plot it on MATLAB, you have a trace which does something, you now can go and, and look at the, the measurement, but also physically see what has happened in the scene. And, and this is sometimes very beneficial to get a better understanding of what has happened. Now, some of the techniques that we typically use in, in um, or that I've typically used in, in this analysis was to sort of track uh, features uh, between images, whether it's sort of full field, meaning we apply to the whole image, or sparse, we uh, apply to certain points. Um, and so we can track features from uh, in a sequence of images or cross images, in essence. Um, using multiple cameras, you know, stereographic rig or even multi-camera views, three or more, you can also obtain a 3D position of um, these features in, in your images. So instead of having a 2D uh, pixel of view, you can also have a 3D pixel of view 
of, of the scene you uh, are interested in. Um, and we can also determine deformation and strain using you know, multiple sets of images doing the same scene. And again, we'll allude to these um, as we, we progress. And we can obviously combine these. You know, We can uh, track features, but also have a 3D location. So we have the motion in three dimensions and, and so forth. So um, you know, we, we can add all of these techniques into a single measurement to obtain more complex uh, measurements. Now, the first um, measurement that I'll uh, talk to is uh, I'll talk of is, is sort of to tr using tracking of features. Uh, now we've used this to determine the slip angle of um, uh, of, of vehicles or tires which we measure. So in, in this scene on the left, we sort of show a camera pointing downwards, sort of uh, testing on a rig where we can control the slip angle by sort of um, moving our gimbal in a specific locations. And if we drive straight, so just for sort of validation purposes. Um, and what you then see on the right is basically features that we've tracked going from one scene to another. So the, the sort of tail of these particles are sort of where they originate and, and the head, the circle is sort of where they move to. Uh, and you'll see sort of different colored images. That's sort of where, where we sort of apply a, a filtering strategy to pick in the form of ransack or something, which is a random sample consensus to move outliers from a measurement. So we basically can just uh, do our measurement uh, using inliers or, or features that we have high confidence are um, actually correct. And if we now place this camera sort of, you know, downwards facing, fixed to the vehicle, then, you know, from a 2D point of view, um, these uh, features in the, in the direction they move indicate basically the slip angle of the vehicle. So if they move at a 45 degree angle, then you have a 45 degree slip and so forth. So, you know, simply tracking features in 2D, one can do um, slip angle measurements. And we've actually developed three techniques um, to do this. So the first is the planar technique, which I've alluded to just now, uh, where we simply track features on a single camera and, um, you know, whatever angle they're moving in, that is effectively slip angle. Now, the issue here is because we're typically dealing with off-road uh, vehicles, is that we induce other motions moving over off-road terrain. So the vehicle might be rolling, it might be, you know, heaving up and down, or it has some sort of pitch motion. And this can induce additional measurements, you know, which might look like uh, slip angle measurements in, in to the camera motion as well. Um, so we developed a, a, another technique, which is applied first to a single camera, which is called a sort of, um, what I refer to as the uh, 2D pose technique, which uh, tries to determine the pose between two images. And, and the pose is, is not just the motion of the between the two images, but also captures the roll pitch and, and, and sort of your effects. Uh, between these these images, so you you capture basically the three rotations between two images, but also a, a unit vector of in which direction it's moved uh, in as well. And and using this, you can hopefully can uh, compensate for any of the induced pitch and roll motions when you traverse over a uh, rough terrain. Uh, and then of course we apply this to a two D camera, oh, sorry, a, a stereo camera rig. We have two cameras, which then obtain uh, we obtain three D positions of each of these features. And then we can track, similar to the pose, all the motions, but in the pose technique, the, the motion that we captured was a sort of unit vector. Uh, here we can actually get the, the motion in terms of, you know, millimeters or meters, whatever units we're working with. And, and again, you can see in the top curve, this basically is the speed that we've uh, measured using uh, two different sensors. One is the camera 3D and the other one is a Corovid sensor, which is, you know, a commercial slip angle measurement system. And we compared these measurements over the Belgian paving. So this is again a fixed slip angle measurement. The slip angle here is supposed to be, I think in this Im image, zero degrees. Um, and you can compare now the Corvid to these three different techniques. In general, the Corvid, which is, uh, you know, probably close to $100,000 uh, sensor, uh, actually provides worse measurements than a simple camera measurement, which is a few hundred dollars um, in essence. So and specifically also at lower speed. So, you know, we could get very good measurements um, but also just using very low cost um, um, sensors. Now we've also been progressed further with these techniques, applying them in, in real time. So we can actually real time determine the slip angle and then also combine them using sensor fusion techniques with uh, inertial measurement units um, in order to get the slip angle of a vehicle, uh, but cleaner and, and um, reducing the, the, the requirements of the speed of our cameras and so forth by using this um, um, sense of fusion technique, but I'm, I'm not going to allude on that too much in essence. I'm just going to focus on the camera measurements further. 
So uh, another technique we can use is to measure longitudinal velocity. Um, or longitudinal slip of a tire. So here again, we want to measure the relative motion between a tire and terrain. And again, if we track features on the tire and the terrain, you know, we can hopefully determine the velocity of them. And then using the differences, we can determine the slip velocity. Now, this is using a single camera technique on a drum test rig where we, you know, initially sort of fix the interface. We could very easily say the interface is here and we can track features on the tire mover to the uh, contact uh, point and also features on the drum and move that to the contact point. And then we have basically the different velocities of these two objects. And from there we can measure slip. Uh, we've also then sort of uh, took a, this further where we uh, identify the in, uh, interface of region um, by applying clustering techniques to the different uh, points on the tire. Uh, and in that case, we don't have to, to physically fix the uh, interface we can have that sort of be defined on the camera so as you know you have motion the tidy flex uh, track sort of where this interface technique is um in essence so the nice thing is about this technique rather than making use of the angular velocity and the roll radius to measure the velocity of the tire at the interface we directly measure the velocity of the tire at the interface um taking consideration you know any sort of twisting of the tire you know um, any sort of flexion of the tire, uh, we get to the measurements directly. So if we compare these measurements to typical drum test, where we will have an encoder measuring the drum speed and encoder measuring the wheel speed, um, we get sort of this result over here, which um, in these sort of very slow dynamics, we get um, almost identical results. Um, but you sort of see here at sort of 15 seconds where we now release a braking force. Um, and on the right, we sort of zoom into that uh, region that the encoder measurements has this oscillation that we have. And this is simply because now we, we've, uh, you know, broke, we've uh, break the wheel until it sort of locks up and then we let it go. And then we, we excite this torsional dynamics of the tire. And we, in, in encoder measurements, we can see these oscillations that occur in the measurements, which we don't see in, in terms of the contact uh, patch, uh, whether the tire actually interfaces. So this is just simply now the torsion. And we can actually now measure the torsional uh, um, sort of frequency based on, on this measurement uh, or these two measurements at the same time. Uh, at the same time, uh, quite often your encoder measurements are faulted. So here you'll see the camera measurements, which are completely unfaulted in this instance, um, gave us a little bit of a earlier measurement to the slightly faulted um, wheel encoder measurements, which are typically employed to just clean up the, the measurements. So we have got a, a slightly earlier measurement um, and we have directly the measurement of the um, slip at the, the contact patch taking consideration any deflection that the tire might uh, um, occur. Um, further, we've also sort of uh, took in this, uh, taken this technique and um, applied it to 3D uh, measurements. So in here we have two cameras viewing the contact patch. And in essence, this actually makes the problem a lot easier to do. Um, it's, it's a bit more computationally inefficient, so it's really a technique you have to apply in, in post-processing. Um, but the interface between the tire and terrain is actually now much easier to determine because, in essence, it's really the furthest point away from the tire or from the camera. So we simply look at what is the point furthest away from the cam camera, um, and, and we can then sort of fit a parabola around that to sort of say this is the, the interface between the tire and the terrain. Uh, and then we can track features um, on the terrain and features on the tire. Um, and we don't have to do any sort of uh, compensation for the, the terrain velocities that are close to the camera because in, in pixel coordinates, they'll be faster uh, because they have larger motion being close to the camera. Here we have 3D coordinates, so you know we don't have to compensate for that. And, and we can also compensate for any sort of uh, angle that the cameras might be skewed in terms of viewing the actual scene of interest. Uh, that we have so so we've uh, then also compared this technique over then uh driving a rough belgian paving uh with traditional techniques and again um in, in in certain cases where we have uh very good control of the uh setup we get very identical measurements uh but when we now sort of move over the terrain um you know we typically assume a static roll radius in, in this again a camera technique the the roll radius completely changes it, but we don't have to compensate for it because we directly measure the tire speed and the terrain speed directly with a single sensor. Uh, and therefore, with a single sensor, uh, we sort of compensate for a lot of aspects um, in essence as well. Um, so this still revolves the motion of the tire basically 
um, as a single point, so we don't do any tracking uh, in this instance of, of um, the whole sort of circumference of the tire to get different slip velocities across the circumference. We still boil it down to a single point uh, measurement on both the terrain and the, the tire in essence. Uh, but this this um, was was quite a nice technique to employ on uh, off-road terrain. So taking the, the further now, um, instead of use, tracking sort of sparse points, we can also do this with um, a full um, with sort of full uh, field measurements. It's where we try and, and effectively track each and every single point uh, between different images. So we, we basically do deformation measurements. In this. So with, a, with two cameras, we can determine the uh, profile of, of an object. And if we have um, two profiles at different uh, states or different times, we can determine deformation between these two uh, states. And, and in essence, the, the states could be different. Um, you know, for example, we can measure the deformation relative to an uninflated, unloaded um, tire, or as in this analysis, which was an inflated, vertically loaded tire, um, where we now compare that as a reference point and then the sort of um, fully braked tire, so almost where it completely locks up what is the flexion we see on this tire. So, you know, um, what this now allows you to do is basically uh, measure perhaps the, the uh, if you, if you do this over different time periods, you can perhaps measure all the different velocities of the circumference of the tire instead of just having a single point. I haven't really looked at that uh, on the outside of the tire in essence, but we'll get to that on the inside of the tire. Um, but you can also now here see the deformation. So we can see here that uh, the tire is deflected uh, by a, a certain uh, amount um, towards the left. Um, and, uh, you know, we can use this to determine sort of the... Uh, Stiffness, the longitudinal stiffness of the tire, uh, based on having a force measurement and this deflection measurement. So we could do a simple, simple jump test rig, where we gradually um, break the tire. We get different force measurements. We get different um, uh, um, deflection measurements, and from there we can get the longitudinal uh, stiffness of the tire um, while it's rolling, not just in a, in a static sense. So the rolling stiffness, of, uh, longitudinal rolling stiffness of the tire, or of a rolling tire, essence. And we can also get the deformation natural. So you could probably use this then as well to validate um, more sort of FEM-based tire models, in essence, to see whether you get the same sort of sidewall deflection or coppice deflection, whatever you want to do, uh, and validate uh, that model. Because if, obviously, if you generally have a very good uh, coppice deflection, or if your coppice deflection is very accurate, that generally means that you should have a fairly good uh, physical repetition model. It's then just normally the um, friction model that uh, uh, one needs to sort of then introduce as well. Um, so taking this measurement now where we, we measured on the outside of the tire, um, there was sort of great interest to place this measurement on the inside. So we developed this uh, T2CAM, which we refer to, which is sort of a short abbreviation for tire terrain camera, um, which allows us basically to uh, place cameras inside of the tire. And we have this mechanical stabilization system such that the cameras are stationary um, while the tire might rotate. So we can then always look at the area in contact with the, with the terrain. So we view the inside of the tire, always in contact terrain, because that's generally where all the interesting um, information happens. We don't have to sort of get a measurement every time the camera gets around. We get that view all, all the time. Um, and it's a purely mechanical stabilization. So, you know, there's no control systems. It's, it's very, very simplistic and, and sort of robust uh, method. Uh, we record the camera measurements typically on an embedded PC inside a tire and then sort of just download the data then afterwards that we might be interested in. Um, so we've used this then, uh, system then in a lot of other measurements to take measurements on the inside of the tire, which um, is nice from a thermomechanics point of view because, you know, some of the me other measurements, you you know, you always need to be able to view the scene. Um, and if you're doing tests on uh, deformable soil, you know, sand, mud, or whatever it might be, um, quite often the contact area is going to get uh, uh, covered in sand and you won't be able to directly measure the, the region in contact with the terrain. So you can't use some of the techniques in, uh, developed earlier to um, soft terrain sort of analysis. Um, we also have a very controlled environment inside. We can control the lighting, so we have very good control of what, what is going to happen uh, on the inside of the tire. And then we can do a lot of analysis. And I'm going to allude to some of the analysis that we've done on the inside of the tire. So this is sort of very early measurements that we obtained um, um, in conjunction with uh, Crowell in, uh, in the US. 
which shows sort of deformation, measuring the deformation of the tire as we sort of drive over a trapezoidal bump. In this case, sort of slightly um, on the, the, you know, half the tire is on the bump and half the tire is off the bump. And we can measure the deflection relative to, again, some state, whether this be, I'm not 100% sure if this is a relative to an inflated, uh, but not vertically loaded tire, or this is an inflated vertically loaded tire, but 100% sure. Uh, at, at this instant. But again, we can measure the information of the tire relative to that. And again, very useful perhaps in determining uh, sort of or validating and building FEM models or um, quasi bulk finite element models of uh, a tire which, uh, um, you know, you could validate easily the carcass deformation of, of the tire driving over different objects, whether it be cleat, static, or dynamic uh, measurements as well. Um, so what we can also then do is we can do full field uh, velocity measurements. So we take measurements uh, over time and we sort of track particles uh, at, uh, over different sequences, over different time steps, and we can then get uh, the longitudinal velocity of the tire. We get the 3D velocity of the tire in X, Y, and Z coordinates, um, but we can then specifically look at the longitudinal velocity, which is you know, just an X, or we could have a look at uh, a sort of, um, you know, the velocity tangential to the um the normal vector of the tire um, in essence as well uh, whatever you want there's you know there's a lot of options available because we have so much information inside and again what's beneficial here is that um we uh, can measure the velocity inside of the tire uh, taking the radius of, uh, of the tire in consideration we now we can actually now see sort of see what is the, the tire doing inside is it is it sliding across the velocity or is it sort of a a, a, you know, a, a rigid drum or some sort of combination of that in, in terms of the velocity profile that we get inside a tire. Um, and again, we can relate this possibly to the velocity outside the tire by either assuming uh, you know, we have a rigid drum sort of analogy, we can move the velocity on the inside to velocity outside using the, the, the thickness of the tire and the different radius of the tire, which again, we measure directly as well, because we are not just measuring the velocity, but we're also measuring the complete deformation of the inside of the tire. So we have information of the, of the radius of the tire completely um, of the whole uh, contact or the region that we're viewing, but also the complete velocity vector of each point as well. So we can, with that, do a lot of measurements, know exactly uh, how it's deforming over the terrain, but also what is the different velocities of different components. And, and you can possibly use this uh, in conjunction with sort of uh, chair mechanics model to get sort of what is the input over the model in terms of, um, you know, the sliding um of over soil and so forth by trying to relate the velocity inside to the velocity outside as well as uh, perhaps making use of um the deformation to get a better idea of perhaps what is the uh, vertical load on the tire uh, if you um you know this is a sort of a, another study we're working on but it's very early days so using this information inside the tire to get uh, uh sort of force measurements applied to the tire on the outside um and hopefully that you know, could in future enable a lot of uh, ease and development and validation of uh, term mechanics uh, soil models um, in the future. Um, and again, here doing uh, these tests at Virginia Tech, uh, we compared the traditional measurements that we had. Um, and again, we got very good correlation, uh, boiling it down from a full, uh, full field to a single point again, because traditionally that's what you can you obtain. You only get a single measurement of, this is the velocity of the tire, this is the velocity of uh, the center of the wheel, and therefore this is the slip, assuming quite often a static radius or uh, somehow measuring the radius um, in, in, in some other methodology as well. So, so we got a very good uh, agreement and uh, that a lot more information as well. Uh, we've also then moved into doing strain measurements. So again, if we have the deformation between two states, we can determine the strain between those two states. Um, and, and the idea here is to move to perhaps towards uh, smart tires, which you know you can uh, place strain gauges inside the tire, um, and, and you know using strain determine what is the loading on the tire. Uh, and we've tried to focus specifically on agricultural tires. A lot there's a lot of work being done on. Uh, passenger tires, which you know, it has a fairly homogeneous tread, and, and here we do it sort of on a large lug, still a, quite a small uh, tire, it's a 16 inch uh, tire, uh, but um, has quite large lugs. And we weren't sort of interested in seeing what is the effect of the lugs on the strain that we measure. And we started off doing static tests using TG Cam on the inside of tire measuring strain, 
Um, and you know, sort of the, the nice colorful pictures on the bottom show a sort of inflation test where we measure the strain relative to a uninflated, unloaded tire. And you can sort of see here that um, you have regions of high strain and low strain. Um, and, and it sort of matches with the tread pattern. So you can sort of see that the, the tread effectively stiffens up the tire in certain regions. And you have areas which have higher strain and lower strain due to the um, non homogeneous um, um, stiffness of the tire. And again, this could be beneficial from validating uh, FEM models um, as well in, in, in future. And again, we can sort of do vertical tests. So we now we perhaps compare um, uh, this, the, the uh, deflection or the, the strain relative to a inflated but unloaded tire. And we can see how the vertical load um, affects the strain. And we can sort of see again that the, what the effects of the lug is that we see high strain regions um, where the, the lugs are situated. And again, we can do this in the longitudinal direction and the lateral direction. Um, and, and in general, what we see is that the lugs um, have a significant effect, effect in the static, um, in, you know, in these static tests in terms of where we will see high strain. So if we sort of boil down to this top right uh, uh, lines that you see are sort of sectional lines through uh, uh, the tire for a longitudinal test, uh, showing, you know, I think it's a, a, a longitudinal section, so at different longitudinal positions on the tire, um, or you can sort of see it as different um, angular positions in, in the synthesis in the contact patch, um, at different uh, uh, longitudinal loads. So the percentage of the graph shows you uh, percentage relative to the um, uh, the vertical load of the tire. I, th I think it's the either the maximum vertical load of the tire or the, the actual vertical load to ninety five percent of the vertical load or it's the load index of the, uh, the tire, I'm not 100% sure again at this instant. But again, what we could see was there were regions of very high strain and regions of, uh, which almost showed no strain uh, that was um, uh, um, developed in those regions. And again, uh, this is based on the lug profile. Um, so we use this to basically place strain gauges in further tests, where, which are sort of illustrated by these three uh, black dots on the, the nice colorful pictures. Uh, these are regions where we have placed uh, uh, full field strain gauges, lateral strain gauges, and, and longitudinal strain gauges in, in order to, to get some measurements uh, of that. And, and this is sort of, again, measurements that we saw. Um, this top left um, image shows comparison between T2CAM and the strain gauge measurements um, for a specific point. So we sort of simulate the strain gauge in T2CAM, and we get very good agreement between the two measurements. Um, in this instance, the uh, T2 CAM measurements were, uh, in this case, a little bit coarse. Uh, with a strain gauge, you get a, a little bit more finer resolution because we, you know, we each we basically take an image every two degrees of rotation. I think of the camera, it could have been um, a little bit more coarser than that. Um, and and again, what we uh, were interested in to see was our, from T2 with using T2 CAM is whether lugs still affected the location of of strain gauges placed on uh, the tire. Uh, when it's rotating. And again, we basically could do this by analyzing um, the the strain on the tire at different sort of rotations, but sort of simulating a, a full rotation of the tire. And then we get sort of this waterfall plot on the top right, which shows again, sectional views through the tire. Uh, and again, you can see sort of simulating how a strain gauge would move through uh, the profile. And again, you can see that the stra um, uh, strain gauge, depending on where it's placed, will have a different profile that you measure in um, on the strain gauge. So again, where you place the strain gauge relative to the tire uh, will have a significant effect in terms of the actual profile you see on the left hand side, which shows these peaks and these dips, which are very good to use for perhaps what is that applied for uh, loading conditions on the tire um, in essence. And so um, what we've also done, and this is sort of the last thing I'll um, um, mention is, um, modeling of the terrain then in a sort of you know what is the uh, 3d profile of the terrain and and here we might be interested in um, sort of undeformed terrain uh, what is the undeformed terrain before we actually drive over it and we tested this on different terrains so this is specifically testing on snow uh, so we have fresh snow as the first one of the year and then sort of um, uh, snow after a single pass of the tire um, and, and again we could see sort of we can measure the profile um, of the uh, um, of the tread indent into the tire as well as the fresh snow. We then also test a sort of uh, a ice surface, uh, ice watery 
sort of muddy surface uh, grassland as well as sort of mud surfaces. And again, we were successful in being able to, to measure the new formation over these different terrains, uh, these off-road terrains, uh, without um, you know having to do really too much um, in essence. So this allows you to be able to measure the um, the terrain profile, which you can use in, in certain measurements. But probably more so, um, which might be more of interest, is to measure the the rut depth that you're interested in. Uh, and again, what we have is a 3D view that you have, so you get sort of a volumetric uh, indentation of the type which a tire um, uh, makes into into the soil. And uh, you know, there's not a lot of algorithms which directly make use of 3D volumetric deformation. Uh, but you can sort of boil it down to a single rut depth measurement um, along it, which you can automatically determine. So you can have a single camera viewing off the single pass of the tire, off the multiple pa uh, you know multiple passes of the tire, and get the rut depth. Um, and then as you do multiple passes, there's a possibility that you can uh, develop tire models online, not tire models, sorry, soil models online based on uh, different passes uh, of perhaps different uh, tire diameters or tire widths in essence, uh, different vertical loads on the different axles and, and seeing how the deformation changes through different passes to develop what, uh, uh, you know, a sort of course model, what is the soil I'm uh, typically driving on uh, and use that in terms of, um, you know, identifying the capability of can I actually track the soil perhaps uh, you know, am I doing damage to the soil? Should we be, um, you know, not driving on the soil too much, or should we start a new rut because we now, uh, now might be causing vehicles which are platooning behind us uh, to actually get uh, stuck in this in the in these ruts that we are creating? So you know, it opens up a lot of uh, sort of capabilities in terms of monitoring the impact of vehicles on soil, uh, but also perhaps identifying uh, whether the vehicles are uh, capable of traversing this soil and making decision whether it's a sort of no-go or go terrain in essence or uh, whether we should be employing, uh, be employing some sort of traction control or tire inflation control in order to be able to get uh, better traction or uh, um, um, smaller rut that, uh, ruts that we're creating in, in, into the um, soil that we're driving over. So in, in summary, um, you know, what digital image correlation or camera-based techniques allows us to do um, is to take images and just apply a, a lot of different measurements on it. And we can do some of these measurements in real time, uh, depending on the speed of the algorithm. Uh, and some of these measurements um, um, are, can give you a lot more information in post-processing, uh, which we can use in, in sort of research areas to um, improve soil modeling, improve tire modeling, as well as general vehicle dynamics, uh, control, and, uh, and and so forth. Um, you know, and, and the idea here is hopefully to, to not just use these systems for the control of the vehicle, but also in terms of doing further research on tires, on soil, uh, and so forth. So uh, in general, our future work is, you know, just to continue on improving the systems and algorithms. You know, there are some algorithms which we can probably um, move over to slightly more artificial intelligence routes using convolutional neural networks to try and speed them up. We have had a look at that at, uh, at some point. We didn't really get a speed up in, in improvement, but um, you know, algorithms are improving all the time. Um, computational performance of, of computers are improving all the time. So you know, there's always sort of, you know, what are the new techniques that we can employ to these images? And again, we have, the uh, nice thing is if you, if you have uh, images, you can always go back and apply different techniques to the old images that have and compare them to uh, your previous techniques and so forth. Um, or you can do real-time measurements in certain cases, depending on the performance um, of the, the algorithm. So yeah, you know, that's generally uh, it from me. Um, I'm open to any questions. Well, I'll give back to Andrew so he can sort of run the session. I'm sure he'll open up to any questions that uh, are on the floor. Yes, thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Boita. That was very insightful, um, interesting work. Because I'm at the University of Pretoria Vehicle Dynamics Group, I am familiar with the work that you've been doing. So um, I think that there's a lot of people that can get some, uh, a lot of insights in, in this work. So um, I have a question. It's a little bit more of a general question, not really specifically. So how did you end up um, concentrating your efforts in camera-based measurements? Like what was the initial drive for um, going in this route? 
Uh, sorry, Dr. Bota, you're still muted. Uh, thanks. Um, so this was sort of interesting, actually. It started my PhD, which was not really based on camera-based techniques. Uh, it was based on control and parameter estimation, um, where we wanted to make use of camera measurement techniques to to be able to get some measurements. So the first thing we want to do is maybe get some um, micro texture measurements of the terrain using 3D techniques. And from there, we can get perhaps a, a rough estimate of friction of the terrain, uh, but also then use this um, for sort of a measurement of slip, which we could then use in parameter estimation and control systems. But uh, as we were doing sort of a very interesting projects at the time, there was always this, you know, we could probably apply camera techniques here as well and see what we can get. And, and you know, I had all of these side projects and at some point in my PhD, there was a lot of interest in to rather taking the side projects and finishing them off. Um, and, and then we just sort of developed these camera techniques. And, and you know, it was uh, once we had the camera techniques there, uh, uh, going to sort of some of these conferences and, and, and listening to some of the issues that people had, you know, measuring the the, uh, the rolling radius inside the tire uh, using lasers, you know, every now and then was, was what people were quite often doing and we were like well you know we could probably do this using a camera and then get a, a much better picture and then we sort of started developing t2 cam and so forth so it was uh, sort of by by accident i would say and then just sort of seeing you know what could be of interest and then you know applying these these very interesting techniques to different measurements as many measurements as or um, capabilities that we could sort of envision it uh, being applied to all right, uh, thanks for that. Um, I have a general comment for, I think it is Sergey in the Q&A tab. He asked, will recordings be available and um, and slides? So yes, the recordings will be available on the YouTube, ICVS YouTube channel. So look out for the videos in um, a few days from now. And I don't know if you would like to share the slides. Um, we can distribute through an email to the participants, Dr. Berta. Sure. Okay. Um, then I'll start at the bottom, the oldest question. So Anonymous asked, um, have you tested the ultimate ranges of the slip angle measurements or longitudinal slip measurements? As in what is the fastest and slowest the vehicle can drive while still giving accurate measurements? Uh, okay. Yeah. So I, I sort of initially read that as the, the angular range that we can obtain, which, you know, by the way, Carver has a sort of 15 degree range um and, and the camera techniques has, has no range you can do 360 degrees around um, any slip angle effectively in terms of speed we have done some testing we haven't focused uh, on that uh, but we have uh, done testing up to 100 kilometers an hour uh using the camera techniques um the one thing i would say with the camera techniques is that it's very there's a lot of parameters that affect it um for example you know lighting is very important so doing if, if it's a good lighting day uh, outside then you can uh, sort of make use of very uh um, quick shutter times and, and small apertures and, and things like that, uh, where you can then get a much faster measurement. So what we what we've developed um, in, in sort of few, and I haven't discussed it here, but uh, uh, as well is that we we have a, a system where we measure the vehicle speed with a very sort of rough course. It's more for the slip angle measurement uh, using a GPS to measure the vehicle speed, and and using that we basically change the triggering of the cameras to be uh, either smaller or wider. Uh, or shorter and longer to to try and and make sure that the pixel displacements um, are a sort of set pixel length in essence, um, and in doing so we get better accuracy measurements at slow speeds because we take uh, we take measurements of a longer period so we have more um, displacement so therefore we get better accuracy at low speed, but it also allows us to go at faster speed because we're going to be pulsing very quickly and getting so at the the at speed, the, the two effects that you have is firstly the limitation of the camera, how fast can you physically take images? And, and then the next is the, the blurring of the images, um, which is really related to your uh, shutter time. And that's related to the amount of light, your aperture and stuff. And so there's a lot of room you can play with over here. Um, in essence. But yeah, we've tested to, up to um, at least 100 kilometers an hour, um, um, the system that we've, we've developed. Okay, cool. Um, I see Dr. Keen also asked a question. I don't know. He's usually very um, enthusiastic to ask the question in person. So I will wait and see if he wants to pop up in the moderation box. Yeah, here, here he is. 
Right, so Dr. Keen, um, you are free to ask any questions. Oh. Hello, Tinas, how are you? Good to see you again. Yes. I've seen your conferences yeah, yeah. In, in the past. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff here and uh, um, a sort of few questions. Uh, the, the one that sort of came to mind to start with was that there may be people in the audience who are quite interested in trying some of these techniques. So I thought from a researcher's viewpoint, could you say something about how long it took to design your first camera-based measurement instrumentation, then how long it took to, got it, to get it to work and to be able to calibrate it to, accept, to an acceptable accuracy? And uh, follow up from that really is, are there any problems or limitations that you found with CBM um, instrumentation? Sure, yeah, yeah, interesting question. So, um, yeah, so the first uh, techniques we developed were actually quite quick to, to get up. And there's a lot of um, uh, open source software which can make a lot of the techniques easy to do. Um, you know, OpenCV is a, is a great toolbox for you in, um, in order to calibrate some of your cameras and, and to do a lot of things. And, and they have, um, I would say, there's a lot of help online of using OpenCV. So anyone that wants to start, I would probably advise them, you look at OpenCV, look at the community, they also have a sort of manual that helps you getting some indication of this. Um, so, you know, doing three-dimensional measurements, um, the, the initial measurement using OpenCV uh, was quite quick in essence. You could probably set up something, um, you know, within a week or something, getting something rough um, in a sense. But uh, to the point where we got, it took quite a while because we've, with the, a lot of the measurements that we've sort of ended up with uh, was using uh, in-house developed uh, digital image correlation techniques. Um, which um, effectively allows uh, quite often uh, digital correlation takes um, in, a, in a traditional sense a block and matches it to another block in another image. But if you now have um, distortion of the image via from viewing it from a different angle or it, you know it's straining or whatever, that block doesn't map directly. So we now have a technique where this block is allowed to shear and strain and stretch. It's basically the block itself. Um, is not square in it, in it uh, it's, it's going to rotate. It can, so that gives us better measurements um, for different angles, uh, as well as with different straining of the material. So that took a while um, to, in essence, do to write that um, sort of algorithm and get it tested and things like that. Uh, in terms of getting it to, to accuracy, again, that really depends on what accuracy you want. Um, in essence, if you have very high accuracy in the bars, you're going to have to spend time in terms of developing more of these, these more accurate techniques. But if you use OpenCV with some of their uh, methodologies, you can get decent accuracy depending on the camera so that you're using as well. Um, fairly quickly and getting some measurements going in, uh, in essence. Um, so it's, you know, it's difficult to say because, you know, you can get very um, rough measurements very quickly. Um, and then depending on what you want to focus on, you can spend some time in improving that technique, uh, improving the calibration because again, um, you know, there's some limitations in the open source um, stuff. They assume specific um, models or specific things, um, and they're good for initial stuff. But afterwards, you might want to move on to, to at least uh, doing some some of your own modeling or some of your own um, aspects that you want. But but OpenCV open will get you probably 95% of the way there, um, in essence, um, for, for 3D and tracking of features, not probably for the strain. Uh, I don't think that there you're probably going to spend a lot more time. In terms of um, the, the problems that you have, yeah, so so this I should say, um, camera-based techniques have, have issues and, and, and benefits. You know, one is that your accuracy is dependent on uh, the cameras you're using. So the more expensive cameras you're using, the higher resolution, the better accuracy you get, uh, but quite often the cost of computational, uh, computational effort. So you know, it takes longer to do the computations and also now, you can't capture as fast and you might have to have a larger storage if you're doing uh, offline um, um, application of your algorithms. Um, and then sort of all the issues that come with cameras, you know, if it's dark, you know, you don't really get a good scene um, or you might get motion blur based on, you know, if you haven't set up your camera for the right uh, aperture or um, um, shutter time or whatever that might be, you you, you can get uh, really blurry images which aren't beneficial to use in any application. And then obviously, you know, um, if you can't see your objects, then you can't measure them at all. So, you know, you need to be able to see your objects in essence. So, 
so there are definitely issues with with cameras so if you if on inside a tire where we have a lot of control of the uh, lighting um you know that's very nice because we can set everything to fix uh, measure uh, you know fix aperture fix um shutter time and we know we're going to get decent measurements but on the outside we have shadows incoming um, you know the sun changes um, position or you know it goes down or there's a cloud that comes in uh, you know you need to have algorithms to can compensate for the lighting and in certain cases maybe add additional lighting to to make up for that so yeah so there are definitely um, some limitations of of uh, the camera based measurements and so there's lots of story data as well you know instead of having a single trace or you know for any measurement you now have images um which you're basically storing if you're doing it offline measurement in essence right i hope that answered most of your question yeah i think so i mean there's there's one point i suppose which um uh some people might be thinking about that do you do most of your experimental work with real-time processing or do you collect the uh, the camera data and then do the processing post 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 process the data because obviously at some point if this is going to be a commercial application then it would need to be real time and the uh, um the, the the speed of processing may actually slow down you know what you're able to look at and and and, and process so is it mostly real time processing or post processing that you do it's a combination i would probably say from the start it's post processing because you want to obviously test the algorithms before you move anywhere near to real time um but the so there's a side a side step angle measurement is that we've got it in real time uh, being able to measure up to 100 kilometers an hour uh, incorporating mm -hmm. sensor fusion techniques as well in there um the longitudinal step that you could do in real time with a single camera uh with the 3d cameras there is limitations in terms of um you know doing the 3d uh obtaining the 3d points of, of the system but if you're doing some uh, other techniques you could possibly get the 3d longitudinal step technique uh, in real time as well uh then the the strain that's price processing it's way too computationally expensive um, in essence to do because it's because you need to do quite complex um, digital image correlation techniques and we quite often doing it on, on high resolution images you know this takes still at this point in time you know seconds if not minutes depending on the resolution of the camera and, and the settings of the algorithm and, and they're not going to be real time you know i don't i don't think in any, any time soon um in essence um, and then the, the 3D deformation. Yeah, we've looked at different algorithms which you can do. Uh, so, so the rough depth that we've done um, real time as well, uh, using different techniques depending on how fast you want to sample them. Um, and you know, um, we have one technique which we could do up to to 800 uh, frames per second, uh, but at some loss of accuracy, your your rough depth accuracy goes down to I think five millimeters or something like that. That should actually have there. But you know, you can get up to I think. 20 hertz with a sub one millimeter accuracy and then if we apply the really same sort of algorithm we apply with the uh, uh the strain measurements then you can get you know very low you know in the in the micrometer accuracy but that's again minutes uh, in essence you can't comp compute so it's, it's a combination of both we try and move we, we're obviously realistic and some of these things won't be able to be moved to real time and and we fix we try and, and use them for research purposes but we know that some of these techniques and, and we have tried to move a lot of these techniques into real-time measurements right are, are there any commercial applications yet or is this still um in development um not directly of yet um the one that's probably closest is the size of angle measurement technique which we've uh, have done quite a lot of development on um incorporating accelerometer measurements and, and gyroscopic measurements on vehicles and, and then sensor fusion algorithms to to get uh, with, with the slip angle measurement to get better slip angle measurements at very low cost um, uh, cost point. So so we we're you know unfortunately we're not a a um, a business unit. We're research. We don't get paid to necessarily sell products in a certain sense. Uh, or my performance never was evaluated on, on that. So you know um, for that we need we need funding and 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 we need someone that um, can actually drive that. Which you know I can only really be a technical expert i can't really drive that technique because i just simply don't have the time um, in order to do that but so, that, so that's definitely been a limitation is that um, is that business arm um, aspect in, in essence taking that up uh, further 
Okay, thanks for that. Cheers. Uh, I think you've got some other uh, people with questions, uh, Andrew. So shall I? Uh, um, I'll, I'll leave uh, leave you with the others. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dr. Keen, for uh, the insightful questions. Um, so I see the next question is from Dr. Sally Shoup. I don't know if she also wants to maybe join us live to ask the question. Give her just a second. Maybe she wants to join. Here we go. You are muted, Sally, if you're trying to talk. All right, how about now? Yes, Loud and clear. Um, thank you. Um, um, I didn't need to read my question personally, and I think you already answered some of it, but I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, the application and who the end users are, especially for these large lug tires and um, how you see that helping like um, practical applications in the future. Um, yeah, so so the idea here with the large lug tires is, is more, mostly for sort of agricultural purposes to a certain degree. Um, you know, they, you know, and perhaps military uh, applications as well, uh, where, where large lugs are possible. But again, you know, a lot of the, the techniques could possibly be employed in, in passenger vehicles as well. Uh, but there are work that has been done in passenger. We're sort of trying to fill the gap on the agricultural, the large lug tires. So the idea here um, is to sort of, um, one, from a research point of view, to, to just do the measurements on the inside of the tire, see, look at different phen phenomena occurring, and see whether we can use this to improve the modeling of the tires, perhaps, um, which can then be used for OEM uh, to develop better multiple dynamic models, which they can use in, in their simulation environments, uh, also for research purposes, and then sort of try and move into the um, smart tire approach where um, you know probably would not be using camera-based techniques, probably because of speed requirements, but we've tried to use it as a tool to enlighten us in what is happening because we can do full field measurements instead of just any single point. But the end the idea here is to be uh, able to hopefully determine uh, the loading conditions of the tire, for argument's sake, um, the pressure of the tire, which you can then use for uh, tire pressure uh, measurement systems or uh, tire inflation uh, uh, monitoring systems, um, or to use them uh, to get the longitudinal, lateral, and vertical forces, which you can then use in, in control systems, perhaps, um, to, to improve any sort of uh, um, you know, traction control system or whatever it might be, uh, in essence, to improve performance of these vehicles on specifically uh, off-road terrain with or the form of off-road uh, uh, terrain in essence. Uh, so I think that that is the, the main focus uh, basically over there. Although, you know, there is also a move of a lot of agricultural vehicles being driven on, on um, hard terrain. You know, they're sort of now becoming vehicles moving from one field to another field on both soft soil and hard terrain. So, you know, a lot of the techniques applied to hard terrain could be used in terms of uh, applying control systems hard terrain to improve uh, the safety and uh, performance of these vehicles on soft and hard terrains. Yeah, I look forward to that since I have to follow tractors on roads sometimes and they're bouncing all over the place. So yeah, get on that. So are you working directly with um, the agricultural companies for some of this or? Um, um, not at the moment so directly. Yeah, it's still it's still sort of early uh, development uh, essence. So we we you know have developed a, a quite a just sort of like had a look at what is happening in, in essence inside the tire, um, and see whether this corresponds to sort of what we see in, in passenger car tires. And there is some similarities, but there's also some deviations, uh, which are interesting uh, to see. Uh, and and then you know the next step is to, to sort of now see in in the controlled environment can we now actually do the inverse go from these measurements to perhaps uh, going to the actual uh, forces on the tires and and i think but then you know it might be interesting to to then sort of uh going to agricultural uh, people saying you know this is the capability that we have um you know can we can we probably interest you in in, 
in developing these techniques for you or you know, using them for research purposes in, on your vehicles. Yeah, and really almost anybody else that goes on road and off road too. Yeah. Nice, nice work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sally. All right, thanks, Sally. So um, we have a next question in the chat or in the Q and A tab. Um, Mr. Loperas, I don't know if he maybe wants to join us on on the call as well. Um, but in any case, I will read out the question. Maybe I lost the slide, but is there any physical prototype with the camera inside the wheel? And how was uh, the vibration issues? Um, how did you come around the vibration issues with the electronic circuits? Um, so yes, there is a, a physical prototype. Um, and most of the measurements we um, showed you in, inside the slides. So if I go back to slides, I don't, unfortunately, I didn't include, oh, okay, perhaps. So yeah, this will probably show you uh, the actual prototype. So you have the, the tire um, over here, which we've applied to jump rig. Inside here is actually the, the camera measurement technique attached to a, a wheel force transducer. So we measure all um, six uh, load components as well as then what is happening sort of the inside of the tire. So this, this shows you, unfortunately, I didn't give a nice view of the actual physical setup sort of from uh, without the tire in essence. Um, um, so in terms of electronic uh, vibration, so we've mainly applied uh, a lot of these tests to sort of at this instance in, inside the tire at low speed applications, um, you know, below 10 kilometers an hour in essence. Um, and, and most of the um, um, electronics that we've used are either uh, developed by ourselves so we can have some sort of control in terms of, uh, you know, how um, vibration resistant are based on the components and, and how we sort of solve them, or making use of, um, so the embedded PC is specifically a, um, a, a ruggedized PC. It, it doesn't have any uh, moving components. It doesn't have a fan. It's, uh, it's a um, fanless component. So that makes them slightly more rugged in general. Uh, and, and most of the components are soldered on instead of uh, using uh, those things. So, so we haven't had a, a many uh, issues with, with that. I think the biggest issue is, is sort of from a power point of view, getting power reliably inside the tire while rotates and jumping around. And in that instance, we basically have three independent slip rings uh, feeding power inside with a sort of, um, I believe, uh, um, I don't think it's a battery, but at least a, a, a high capacity, uh, 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 high uh, capacitance, uh, sort of uh, capacity, uh, capacitors inside there, which can sort of absorb any uh, drop in power uh, momentarily. So we can get uh, better um, sort of measurements. The, um, you know, the cameras themselves, we've, we've driven over them in terms of, uh, Belgian padding. We haven't seen any real issue from the, uh, from them. They've been fairly fairly rugged, and we've we've really abused them on, on a lot of the tests we've done. And the biggest issue we've generally always had is connectors, which as soon as you just take some uh, sort of uh, effort in, in securing the connectors, if you're going to do this on a a a, a more um, permanent basis or commercial product, you probably would not use. Uh, connectors like you would more you would use more rugged connectors because this uses sort of USB connectors which are a little bit flimsy in certain uh, in the, um, situations, but but that you can sort of set, um, solve with using more uh, ruggedized uh, vibration resistant connectors. I hope that answers the the question. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Boita. And um, I have an extra question. So for the soft soil tests that you did, um, obviously. The camera was probably mounted behind the tire or in front of the tire. How did you manage to keep it clean? And is keeping the camera sensors clean um, in terms of uh, stuff that gets fl flung up from the tire um, when you're driving over a vegetation or muddy terrains? Um, how big of an issue is that? And um, also for the, the tracking of specific points on the ground if there's now things flinging around the field of view um, does that affect the the measurements that you have significantly or not yeah interesting question so um i mean you can solve a lot of the issues by camera placement so if you if you place them sort of uh, right next to a mud flap 
you know, you get to you sort of uh, prevent any direct mud being flung into the, the cameras, in essence. And because you can sort of play around with your uh, lenses, you know, you can have the camera mounted fairly high up, but still get the, the, the size you want of, of the area you're, you're interested in measuring in essence. So you can move the camera further away, just get different focal length and you know, closer and again, different focal length. So, so you can, by mounting the camera, get away with a lot of the issues. And to be honest, in, in a lot of the tests that we've done, we've done testing in snowy conditions, muddy conditions, sandy conditions, um, we haven't really had a problem in terms of uh, the, the camera lenses getting, um, you know, dirty or anything like that. I think the, the biggest issue you, you might have is is um, is actually from condensation because you have quite often uh, uh, heat inside the camera, which which uh, or the inside of the camera builds up, which can heat up the, the air inside the one side of the lens. And then if you have a cold, you might have sort of uh, frost building up on the outside. And then you can probably sort out by uh, by having sort of heated lenses or something like that um, in essence. Um, but you can also use, uh, you know, self-cleaning techniques where you um, periodically blow air or you know, water might actually change the lens uh, focal, uh, focal lengths. But, but you could blow air to clean them up periodically, if, should that be a problem in essence. Uh, but we've, we've never really had an issue by simply trying to mount them in, in, in locations which um, prevent any direct mud from thing. In terms of having particles moving uh, in the images, yes, you, that, that could be a problem if you're tracking those those particles instead of the actual terrain. But you could solve um, a lot of this from uh, using uh, ransack approaches or you know a, a random co a sample consensus. So this is a quite a nice technique to to try and remove outliers by trying to see what is the most consistent model that you're seeing inside. Um, you know, so you can sort of see most of the particles are moving in this direction. Any other particle that you see will probably be moving either random or hopefully not as many would be moving in the same direction. If they are, obviously, you know, you could use um, other techniques where you sort of mow go from a, from a time point based, you know, I was moving in this direction. It's physically impossible for me to immediately move in, in the other direction so quickly and then sort of fault out those measurements um, early on and then focus on that. So, so using Ransack and probably some of these very logical filters, you can probably remove uh, most of those those issues. The, I think the biggest issue would be if, and, and, and this can occur in certain measurements, we've seen this in certain um, snowy conditions, is when the, um, uh, you know, you're thinking so much material perhaps that you actually, the visibility that you're, um, of, of the tire or the interface that you're measuring is actually obscured. And, and then you might not necessarily be measuring that specific point. So, so that is definitely something that, that can happen. So that's the one, one of the nice things of inside the tire. You know, you have a very controlled environment. Generally, that's not going to happen, that you're going to get particles being flung into the tire. But outside, the, the, there might be a possibility depending on what terrain you're working on. OK, thanks for the answer. Um, I don't see any new questions in the Q&A tab. So I think that's it from the audience. Um, thanks again for the presentation today, Dr. Bota. It was really insightful. And I think a lot of the participants at least found it interesting as well. Um, I think the research is novel and to put it plainly, very cool to see uh, an interesting measurement technique that people usually overlook in uh, in, in the form of uh, sensors that we have in our pockets uh, in the end of the day. Um, so yeah, thanks for, for the presentation. Well, thank you for having me on this and uh, thank you for the comments. I hope it was uh, insightful to most of you. And yeah, if you have a question, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to the Vehicle Dynamics Group and you know, um, we can hopefully uh, collaborate on some work or, you know, up with some measurements issues that uh, you might be having as well. Great All talk. Right. Take care. Thank you. Um, so, Is everyone seeing everyone again? All right. Uh, thanks, Dr. Boita. So, um, to conclude the session today, I just quickly want to want to thank everyone. Uh, and the audience for attending the session. Um, we will probably have a session again by the end of the month, um, Wednesday, 
the end of the month, I think it will be the 30th. Yes, the 30th, 30th of March, we'll have another session and then we will take a little bit of a break during the April season. But um, yeah, if you want to see a little bit more information on previous um, previous sessions that we hosted, I uh, refer you to the ISTBS YouTube channel where we have a playlist of all the previous events that we held from uh, different speakers about uh, many different topics related to term mechanics. And also please have a look at the ISCBS website for applications to join ISCBS uh, and becoming a member, as well as the resource initiative, which is uh, some work that we've been doing in the background to create a, a collaborative effort between different um, knowledge centers and being able to share that between the different people. So again, thanks everyone for attending today's uh, session. Thank you, Dr. Boetov, for presenting your work and um, we'll see you all next time.